All right, so I guess we can't um, put it off anymore. Today we begin the chapter on the Grail. As may be easily imagined, the situation in Gladstonebury Vicarage, as the winter passed, with Nell and her child under the same roof as her former lover, although it was not strained to the limit of human endurance, was sufficiently uncomfortable to all the three persons concerned. It was obvious, too, that the little boy, though his expressions of it were obscure, missed the rollicking caresses of his mother's husband. Mrs. Pippard, who took upon herself all through December the role of ambassador, though hardly of peacemaker, between Nell's new sanctuary and her old home, kept them pretty closely informed of what was going on in White Lake Cottage. The trend of events seemed to be that Wells Island and Persephone were living out there in an irresponsible trance of amorous happiness, completely self-absorbed and self-contained, and prepared to await any deluge that fate might send with the reckless defiance of their newfound delight in each other. It struck Nell that it was totally unlike all she had ever known of Will, this ensorcerized interim of moonstruck quiescence. As week followed week at the vicarage, each week bringing new agitations between the father and the son, and between herself and each of the two men, she was constantly expecting Zoyland to appear in person, having quarreled with Percy, and full of angry and despotic demands that his wife and her child should return home. But the new year came and nothing of the kind happened. In the end, the cantankerous Mrs. Pippard, having played the part of eavesdropper to the infatuated pair at White Lake till Zoyland nearly threw her out, and having clung desperately to the little Master Henry in the vicarage till Penny Pitches actually did throw her out, retired from domestic labors altogether, and took up her abode with the mother of Red Robinson's bride as a partner assistant in the tea shop business. Hearing that Sally was leaving Cardiff Villa in order to be married to Red, that was Sally that was going out with Red, Mrs. Pippard offered herself as the girl's successor in the mayor's household. But Mrs. Geard, glad enough to return to her old freedom from any servants, very brusquely declined this honor. And thus it was left for the patient visitors in the town to endure the administrations and be subjected to the all-seeing eye of Eudoxia's diplomatic parents. The astounding nature of the scandals which Many of these innocent pilgrims carried home, along with Mr. Barter's and Lady Rachel's Arthurian figurines, concerning the more intimate life of Gladstonbury, can thus be accounted for. But it is hardly necessary in the modest chronicle to state that Zoyland did not beat his wife black and blue, and that Nell did not live with three men at the same time. But although the wild tales relating to Mrs. Pippard's were far from the truth, the two weeks that followed the arrival of Nell under the roof of her child's father and her child's grandfather were charged with explosive electricity. Hmm. Sam's attitude was the same as it had always been, since he had decided to trample down and to kill all natural sex pleasure. He didn't avoid her. On the contrary, he snatched every moment he could when his father was out of sight, to enjoy her society. He helped her with the child, though not proving as skillful as Zoyland in quieting him and distracting him. He kept Penny, Penny from intruding into the spare room, for they had given Nell the William of Orange bed to sleep in. He tried to coax her to give up her awkward and timid habit of retreating into the never-used drawing room, a room that smelt not of dust and mustiness, for it was the only room in the house where Penny was allowed to scrub and tidy up without let or hindrance, but of the dead time itself, like a palpable ghost brooding there inside that locked door, 
brooding over the heavy, magenta-colored tassels that hung down above the front of the mantelpiece, brooding over the green plush sofa, brooding over the massive marble clock that never ticked, brooding over the footstool trimmed with tarnished gold thread, brooding over the upstanding wool basket of Sam's mother's that had never been touched since the young woman died. It was a shock to Sam that one morning, a few days after the opening of the arch, he found Nell sitting in the drawing room with her sewing, which he knew she was shy of his catching her with, on the gold thread footstool over a wretched newly lit fire. Good Lord, he cried, does father know you're in the drawing room? One second, I'll be back in one second. Nell smiled and, bending her head down, drew her needle rapidly and nervously through the small white garment she was making for her son. It was already descending upon her that resigned, effortless passivity, patient, docile, unresisting, in which, because of some hereditary pliability in her ancestors, or at any rate, in the woman among her ancestors, though Dave had something of it too, it was easy for her to sink. She was surprised herself at the drowsy weight of this curious passivity. It had come over her the very first morning she had awakened in William of Orange's bed. She had cried herself passionately to sleep the night before, but that had been rather because, in a briefly snatched talk she had had alone with Sam, he had nervously disengaged her warm arms from his neck than because of any culminating wave of self-pity. Yes, not a tear of all those tears that that first night could Zoylan claim to have evoked, nor the treacherous Percy either. It was Sam alone. Sam not pressing her to his heart. Sam not treating her as his love. Sam not crying out, let's take our child to go away from here, away from all of them, that had broken her down. But she had experienced when she woke up at dawn a feeling towards Sam that was like the feeling which those sweet persecuted lemons in the old ballads kept through weal and woe for their cruel lords. Lemans, L-E-M-A-N-S. Don't know that word. Yes, she had been astonished herself as days followed day and it became clearer and clearer that Sam's whole nature was set upon this inexorable quest of his, at the ap- apathy with which she accepted it. She came near to accusing herself of having allowed her heart to die within her, so numb, so paralyzed, so atrophied did her emotion, after that first night of wild sobbing, seem to have grown. Even a strangely detached amusement had in these last weeks been rising up in her heart, an amusement that was rather schoolgirlish mischief than a maternal humor, as the thought of all those great hulking, blundering men following so crudely and pick prickings of their desire. Under the pressure of this mood, she hadn't been even begun to feel friendly again to Zoyland. Persephone was a totally different matter, and she kept on telling herself several malevolent stories of imaginary encounters with Persephone, during which she brought down that young woman very wholesomely to her knees. But to her yellow-bearded will, she did begin to feel indulgent again, especially when she noted the contorted tricks and arbitrary devices which religion compels its votaries to undergo if they are to love and to refrain from loving, as the two deckers were now trying to do at one and the same time. Yeah, she was wondering to herself, now at this very minute, as she glanced up at the marble clock that had stopped at 20 minutes past two, perhaps the very hour in the night at which Sam's mother had died, what are Sam and her Sam's father, in their preposterous attempts not to quarrel savagely over her, would feel if they could read this queer, humorous turn that her thoughts had taken of late? What had begun to strike her as specially quaint was the way they seemed to assume that what Whatever treaty or truce or peace they patched up between themselves about her, she would accede to without any question. She was like a sack of exciting oats placed in a manger 
between two champing steeds. Well, she wasn't so sure that she would submit to being a sack of oats. As this thought came upon her once again this morning, the corners of her mouth quivered at the second silent smile in which she had indulged herself since Sam told her to wait a second. And her eyes moved from the marble clock to the green plush sofa. What came over me, she said to herself. Am I growing cynical? Am I getting like Percy? A slight puckering in her forehead followed this mental question. And as if in proof that her new detachment was a girlish rather than a maternal emotion, she found herself hoping that her little son, it was about eleven o'clock in the morning, would sleep sound till noon and allow her to leave him alone for another hour in his cradle by the big bed. Mercy! But she didn't miss her own house. That, at least, was certain. It teased her to think of it teased her to think of Percy messing about with her cups and saucers, and forgetting to put the bread in the cake box and the rolls in the biscuit tin. I'm sure she doesn't wash off the sugar basin. She thought to herself, and I know she doesn't keep the cheese on a shelf by itself. Why would you do that? Hmm. I'm gonna have to look that up later. And as she stared at the green plush sofa, the incorrigible immorality of her woman's mind sighed just a little before the free, careless swing of the Zoyland's attitude to life, compared with the impassioned pieties of this monastic establishment. What I really am now, she thought, in place of being the mistress of a wicked baron, is the petted bone of contention in a hermitage. The door which had been left ajar was now kicked open, and Sam came in with a coal scuttle full of coal in one hand, and a pile of large bits of wood in the other. I've told Penny to make you up a good fire, he said, next time you want to sit in here. But why you don't stay in the museum where Father likes to see you sewing in that chair while he's writing his sermons, I can't think. He spoke irritably, but he knew in his heart it was because of his own bad humor when he found her ensconced with his father, that she had invaded this closed-up shrine of the past. Sit down, Sam, my dear, she said, when he had made the fire blaze. I want to talk to you. He obeyed her, but it was not at her side, but upon the plush sofa that he took his seat. You know, my dearest one, she said gravely, folding up her son's nightshirt upon her lap, that if you can stand the way we're living, I can't. Now stop, my dear, stop. Don't interrupt till you've heard what I've got to say. I'm not going to beg you to do anything you don't want to do, so you needn't glower at me as if I were a wicked girl trying to tempt you. It's only this, dear. I was talking to Dave last week, and he said that Percy refuses to take a penny of his money. He says that he can't make her take it, but nothing will induce him to keep it himself. He says if I won't take it, he'll just throw it into the town council fund. I've been thinking about this, Sam, dear, and I've decided that I will take it. Even if Sam chucks chucks Will out because of Percy, they'll be all right. Lord P won't let them come to grief. He's always been offering to help, Will. And with all this money he's getting for this great sale, no, they'll be all right. I'm not going to bother my head about them. She turned and stretched out his heavy hands over his knees, extending all his fingers. Sam did. She didn't. Sam stretched out his fingers. It was as if his hands were yawning with an amorous relaxation unpermitted to the rest of his frame. His shirt sleeves disappeared under the frayed edges of his coat cuffs, and his wrists showed hairy and red. Now that thus beginneth the Grail chapter. And we'll continue with that uh, going forward. Cheers.